Hey guys, it's Leanna and I'm here today to talk about The Blade Itself by Joe Abercrombie. This is a book that I have read four times. <laughs> Why have I read it four times? I'm so glad you asked. Well, the fourth time I read it because I wanted to film a review, which I hadn't done before. Uh, you would think I would have for a book that I've read prior to that three times, but I hadn't. So here we are. <laughs> and I just want to shout it out because I'm realizing that the camera, it's not in frame, but I have a Bloody Nine t-shirt on. And since I wore it, I wanted to get credit for it. <laughs> um, and I can, I, this is not an affiliate link or, or a sponsored anything, but I can leave in the description the link to, this is from Redbubble, so I can leave the link in the description to to this <laughs> if you want one. Any whoosies. The Blade Itself by Joe Abercrombie. I am going to take you through the journey of the multiple times I've read it, briefly, and then we'll talk about why I read it so many times, um, what's good and bad about it, what I get out of it, and why I think you possibly should read it depending on what you're like as a writer. So if you don't know anything about this book at all, this is the first book in the world of the First Law. The First Law trilogy begins with the blade itself, is followed by Before They Are Hanged, and concludes with The Last Argument of Kings. And then the world of the First Law uh, continues on in a series of standalones and short stories, and now a brand new trilogy called The Age of Madness, but it still takes place within the world of the First Law. So I first read The Blade Itself when I was when I was a wee lass, <laughs> and I had been predominantly reading very like heroic, more traditional types of fantasy, sort of truth type of stuff. The Blade Itself, I didn't know anything about it, I hadn't heard of it, it was just like recommended to me by the algorithm on Amazon or wherever I was shopping for books, and it was just, you know, obviously a fantasy book. I actually had a different edition of it that I unhauled, even though hauling books wasn't a thing for me at the time, but I got rid of it because I read it and was like, eh, and then regretted that. And then actually I think I have the same edition again because I bought it again. Because now I've become, you know, a collector and obs obsessive Abercrombie fans, I must have every edition. But that being said, the original cover that I had was quite similar to this one. It's parchment -y, got some, like, runish looking things on it. Like, it's clearly a fantasy book. But I was like, alright, cool. <laughs> it's a fantasy book. Let's do it. And I, if you've read it, or if you've heard about it, then you know that if you're going into this expecting something akin to the Wheel of Time or the Sword of Truth or things like that, that is not what this is. And that is the very reason that I love this book so much now. But at the time, I was like, everything here is horrible. Everyone in it is horrible. Why would I want to read this? <laughs> like, I didn't think it was badly written. I've never at any point in my life thought that it was badly written. I just didn't understand why anyone would want to spend time in this world or with these characters, because they're horrible. <laughs> and I was like, I read fantasy for uplifting escapism, where the good guy has the magic sword and he saves the day in the last minute against all odds, yay! <laughs> and certainly that type of fantasy has great appeal and I absolutely know why I used to read more of it and why I still do sometimes read it because there is something to be said for, you know, the escapism, safety, and security of knowing that like the good guy will do the good thing and despite the odds being stacked against him unreasonably, he will prevail because he has the power of goodness <laughs> or whatever. Like I. There's undeniably something magical and escapist about that. But again, The Blade Itself, and basically any book by Joe Abercrombie, does not do that. Not even a little bit. In fact, Joe Abercrombie himself has said that this trilogy, the project of it, was basically him taking the traditional fantasy story arc of a wizard and a hero's quest and that, and basically flipping out its head and shitting it all over it. <laughs> So knowing that when you go into it, you can identify, okay, well, here's the like chosen one-ish one. Here's your wi wise wizard. Here's like, you know, you can recognize those pieces in it. And like, here's your quest. Here's your MacGuffin. And yet when you see them here, it is like the bizarro funhouse mirror. It's like having just read Nosferatu by Joe Hill. It's like Christmas land. Like <laughs> Christmas uh, land is recognizably Christmassy. <laughs> And it is horrifying, and it is bad, <laughs> it is not uh, magical or fun or escapist, but it's recognizable nonetheless. So one of the main complaints that I've heard, um, and I felt this way a bit myself when I read it, I mean in addition to feeling like this is miserable, why would anyone subject themselves willingly and intentionally to something so miserable? I also did find myself going, where is any of this even going? Like, okay, it's miserable, but also like, 
what what is the point of any of that? So I mean back then the first time I read it I did not go on to read the next books and it was only years later that um, because a lot of people with quite similar reading tastes to mine the way that my reading tastes had where my reading taste had shifted to over time um, people with similar tastes to what mine had become kept lauding Joe Abercrombie and his books kept coming up and people kept saying you know th these books are so great and I'll be honest one of the one of the reasons that I did end up going you know what I'm gonna give it another go was the shallowest reason of all and that was that the Galant special edition like anniversary editions that they did at first they only did like four books they did The Lies of Locke Lamora, which I love and purchased immediately. Um, the For Final Empire by uh, Brandon Sanderson. Another book by an author that I don't remember the name of it, and it's not one that I've read. It's like Stormcaller or something. I don't know, but it's, that one was like, I don't know what that is. And The Blade Itself by Joe Abercrombie. And the, that edition of The Blade Itself, I was like, oh man, that's a pretty book. But I was like, but I read The Blade Itself. I remember. I didn't really like it, but I want that pretty book. And, and my friends were like, well, you didn't like the book, so don't get it. And I'm like, but it's so pretty. So I was like, okay, I will read it again. And if I still don't like it, then I won't get the pretty one. And here we are. <laughs> so, you know, my shallowness in, in cover decision, like cover buys, sometimes pays off. So I reread it and was like, oh, oh, this is my shit. <laughs> I am into this. I still only gave it four stars. Uh, and then the third time I read it, I gave it five stars. And now the fourth time I read it, I gave it five stars again. And I think that is valid. And I want to say that I think that this is the kind of book that if you like it, you will like it more if you read it again. And you will like it even more if you read it again again. <laughs> this is the type of story that unlike uh, thrillers and mysteries or things that have like an intense twist, uh, at the end or that like something like that where like the thing that keeps you going is the like but what is happening where is this gonna go how will this be resolved if it's the type of story where that is the appeal of it is you wondering those things and asking those questions then that's not to say that that kind of book cannot be enjoyable on a reread and that's not to say that there can't be things that you'll pick up on the second time and blah 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 like that's absolutely true but the blade itself and the first law trilogy and the first law books they are not those types of stories they are, don't have this like tight mysterious very like structured plot where you're like this is all leading to this main thing that will be revealed and then we will know the answer to the question like it's just not like that and for that reason I think I like it more I also feel like it feels more real like the world and the people in it feel more lived in because life is rarely that structured that planned that neatly building up to a climax the fact that the magic in this world while it is Pieces of it are explained and as you read more books in the world of the first law, they become more clear and you get more pieces of information. But there's never a sense that this book event like these books eventually will give you the answer. Because much like in the real world, you know, we still have physicists and geologists and like those people aren't just historians. They're not just studying what we've already learned and know. We are still learning today about our own world and our own universe. And similarly in the world of the first law, there are pieces of it that are known. There are individuals within this universe that clearly know more about it than your average Joe, who you are following. And it's just, some of it is also just unknowable. Even the people who are experts in it don't have all the answers. And that feels so much more realistic to me than something where at the end you're like, here's the answer to all the magic. Here's how it works, neatly laid out for you. Again, I do understand the appeal of that type of magic in a book. There is something that the fact that the world isn't actually like that, there is something that is satisfying about a fantasy world where you get all those answers that the real world never gives you. I get that, but I like that this world, it feels more real because it doesn't give you those answers because it's not like, and here's what it all meant. <laughs> that said, like, because when you reread it and when you re-re-read it and when you re-re-re-re-re-read it, <laughs> you know what type of story you're getting into. You know that the story itself is really not the point. <laughs> there is a plot. People who say it's plotless, it's not plotless. There is a plot. But that's not the point. The thing that's driving it onward, the thing that you're here for, is not the plot. And the plot is interesting. It's laden with battle and politics and intrigue and backstabbing and, and twists and turns. That's not to say that that doesn't, that it's just like a bunch of people navel gazing. <laughs> Stuff happens. But it's not a plot driven story. It is a character driven story. And so we are watching these characters like navigate their own horrendous world. And that is what we are here for, is to spend time with them 
as they figure out how to survive in this harrowing world. Now it's very it's it's impossible for me to review this book as though I would had only just read The Blade itself and had never read any books that come later. It's not possible for me to review it as like hey like this is your first entry into it and you don't know what comes next and here's how you feel about it. Because one the first time that I read it I was a very different person and if I had reviewed it then I would have been like uh like he I guess he can write like it's apparent that you know the prose is good and it's you know it seems like it's pretty well cobbled together but just like why why would you want to read this and then by the time that I reread it <laughs> I already I hadn't I didn't know where the story was going to go next but I knew what I was getting into the second time I read it and then the third time I read it it was having read all the books that come after it so it's just I've I'm not able to review it as though it's my first time into it and what it will be like for you the first time you go into it. What I can say is that it is a rewarding read if what you are looking for is a character driven story, if what you're looking for is something grim dark and cynical and at times nihilistic, darkly humorous and just <laughs> the best word that I can constantly, which I've said multiple times in this video, is real. It feels real and not because like this historically could have really happened because there's magic like obviously it's not real but these feel like real flawed layered human beings who are navigating an intensely flawed and corrupt and violent world and and yet other grimdark I've read not all can go overboard on that and just be only darkness only horror only depression only misery and that's not to say there isn't a great deal of horror, misery, and violence in these books, but the world, no matter how dark it is, is never just darkness. And so it's reminiscent to me of some of my other favorite books. Like I really loved Angela's Ashes for a long time. I mean, I still do, but it was like my official favorite book for a long time. You weren't expecting to hear about Angela's Ashes in a review about the blade itself, were you? <laughs> but if you've read Angela's Ashes, it's the harrowing memoir of an Irish man's childhood growing up in like absolutely abject poverty in Ireland. Um, and it's but it's told through the eyes of a child and so there is there is undoubtable humor <laughs> there is absolute comedy in what he is experienced and what he is told as a child the way that a child like the, the sense and the logic that a child applies to the world that they are confronted with so in an Abercrombie book I feel similarly like there's plenty of gallows humor but there's also genuine just humor and I don't want to say that it's all just violence and jokes because it's not there are heartfelt moments there are heartbreaking moments, there are tragic moments, there are violent and horrifying moments, there are comedic moments. That is why it feels real because life is not as pretty as a heroic fantasy would make it out to be, but it's not as bleak as plenty of grimdark makes it out to be. The world that we inhabit and that the, these characters inhabit is similar in that unfortunately there is a great deal of corruption, a great deal of abuse of power, a great deal of bullying, a great deal of injustice, and that is all reflected here. But for every injustice there is also a person with hope. For every malevolent individual there is a hopeful and kind and loving one. And yet humans are also never that simple. Uh, a, an evil person is not evil 24-7. <laughs> they're not evil when they wake up, they're not evil when they're eating porridge, they're not evil when they go to sleep. They probably have people they care about, they probably have things that keep them up at night, they probably have things they think that they have done well. Similarly, people who regard themselves as noble and try to do the right thing definitely aren't perfect and definitely have dark thoughts and are capable of dark things, possibly more so sometimes if life makes them the pendulum swing the other way, so to speak. The main takeaway from Abercrombie and this is an in incredible introduction. I, I mean, this is a review of The Blade itself, but I mean, I can't talk about it without the greater world of the first law. What you get in The Blade itself is this multiple perspective introduction to a world where there is no such thing as the good guy and there is no such thing as the bad guy and you just got to get used to it. <laughs> you just got to get used to the fact that everyone you're following here is a person in this world. And that's really all that can be said about them. You cannot label them as the good guys or the bad guys. You cannot put them in boxes. You cannot neatly call them a hero, an anti-hero, an anti-villain, a villain. They defy definition because human beings in the real world <laughs> defy definition. And that when you pick up the blade itself the first time is unusual and a little rough to get used to because especially fantasy tends to not be that 
structureless, <laughs> but when you read it and reread it and re 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 read it, I just become spoiled for every other kind of book because few other authors capture the messy, layered, often grim truth that is humanity, that is institutions of power, that is war, that is everything really. So should you read The Blade itself? Absolutely. Will you give it five stars the first time you read it? I don't, I don't think, I don't necessarily feel like it deserves five stars the first time that you read it. I don't know that it's possible to appreciate it to the full extent the first time that you read it. But because even though I've said that the plot doesn't really, isn't really the point of these books, there is a plot. And by the end of the trilogy, there are answers to questions that are posed in the first book. And despite it not being that type of book, where everything is a puzzle box with a MacGuffin and an answer and a twist reveal, it's not that kind of story. And yet, and yet, much like how actually, you know, an actual criminal investigation or mystery is not as neat as, you know, an Agatha Christie, like, first we suspect this guy, but that's a red herring, and then we find the telltale thing, and then they confess, and then we have our meetup. Like, it's not that neat, and yet you begin to see the hints and the seeds of the truth in the beginning. And so the more times that you read it, the more you realize how, despite feeling directionless, there are so many seeds planted for what is to come. So that without you realizing it, it's not the kind of book where you're sitting there going, well, that's going to be important later. Let me write that down. Well, that seems to be foreshadowing something. Let me write that down. Life isn't really that way. So you just kind of things are happening and you're like, stuff's happening. People are doing stuff. And by the time the end rolls around, the end feels earned. <laughs> the end feels like, yeah, that... Yeah, that fits. That didn't come out of nowhere. You clearly didn't decide this at the last minute because you needed an ending. Because when I go back to reread it, I'm like, oh my god, you just snuck in there all these little hints and all these truths that would have to be there for the end to be the way that it is. And when you reread it, you're like, that is genius for you to have just put all this in without us realizing you were foreshadowing anything but it makes the payoff that much better. And I don't want to oversell the payoff of the end of the trilogy because the end of the trilogy is just as much of a haha -ha, shit on fantasy expectations as the rest of it is. It's not a satisfying neat answer. And yet the ending is conclusive and does, it is the, is what everything has been building towards, even if it didn't seem that way. And even if it's not in the way that you would typically expect. And so, I find immense joy reading and rereading and re-re-re-reading and re-re-re-re-reading the blade itself because the characters, even from page one of this debut novel, are so fully fleshed out and fully realized and fully flesh and blood human beings that have distinct personalities that you don't even have to see the dialogue tag of who is speaking to know who is speaking because the patterns of their speech, their idiomatic ex expressions, their worldview is so clear. And that doesn't mean it's simple, it just means it's recognizably them. That from book one, you're like, yeah, these are characters that I know. And when I go back to read the first book, it's not like, oh, this is early days. Like, I know them and I love hanging out with them, even though this world is grim AF. So yeah, basically I'm saying, <laughs> if you're cool with what I just described, you should read The Bleed itself. And you should take it for what it's worth the first time you read it. But I do encourage you to reread it once you've read the later books because it's a rewarding reread. I love it more every time that I read it. And I, I can't recommend it enough. And yet that I don't want people going into the first book expecting to be wowed by the first book because while I was the second time that I read it, I was into it with the first book. I was still like, but also where is any of this going? Like, all right, like this is definitely up my alley more than it was the first time I read it, but also like kind of low key, what was the point of any of that? <laughs> and then the third time I read it, I was like, ah, I think I need to give this five stars. Cause like there is a point to this stuff and like, I see what you did. And now the fourth time reading it, it's just me curling up with that comfort bowl of mac and cheese where I'm like, yep, I know these characters. I know this story, let's do this thing. It is perfect. And I wouldn't change anything about it, even though the first time it doesn't hit the same. I wouldn't change a thing about it. As a pottery read, it's perfect. So let me know in the comments down below if you have in fact read The Blade itself, if you agree with me having read it on my assessment of it, if I have now inspired you to pick it up, uh, if you read it and you hated it, feel free to let me know that as well because I was there too. Once upon a time, I low-key hated it. 
<laughs> whatever you want to let me know. I post videos on Saturdays, other random times as well, but definitely Saturdays. So like and subscribe, particularly if you like Joe Abercrombie, because I take every excuse I can find to talk about Joe Abercrombie. <laughs> anyway, yeah. I'll uh, see you when I see you.